This episode is brought to you by Rick's Eyewear. Eyewear that inspires confidence. If you would like to buy some premium eyewear, sunglasses, blue light frames, prescription, head online now, rickseyewear.com.au and check it out. Caps has been Australia's home of headwear since 2012. From snapback to fitted, curved peak to flat peak, our hats will fit anyone and everyone. Since then, we've grown and evolved into the leaders of US sports apparel in Australia. Head online at caps.com.au and check it out. Righto, let's get into the show. Righto, Jakey boy, we are back. I'm going to start with a bit of energy. It starts from the top today. It's the earliest podcast we've ever done. Uh, And it's because we've got the busiest man in Australia. Very busy. I'm very excited about today's podcast. Ferg, welcome to the show. Good to get you out of bed, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously. It does give me out. Didn't sleep last night. Freezing in this city in it's the morning. Freezing, but geez, I'm excited about this chat. Um, Fergus Watts is joining us for anyone that uh, is listening and tuning in today. And look, I was going to do the introduction like I normally do, but there's no point me doing it because I won't do it any justice. So, Ferg, I'd love you to touch on a little bit of your background and your story, but you know, your roles and um, the, I don't really know where to start. You're, you're a very accomplished man. Well, you're very kind, but um, no, mate, I'll, uh, so my my background is, um, I was born in the UK, I came out to Australia with, um, my, my parents had a business and basically the business went bust all around the world except the one in Australia, it was a recruitment business. Anyway, we came out for, for that and then I, li- I lived my life growing up here and, uh, and, and then was drafted to the Crows and so um, went over to the Crows as a first round pick and, and came back to St Kilda. Anyway, long story short, had a lot of injuries and busted my leg up pretty bad and got spat out the other end pretty early. Thinking I was going to have a 15-year career and be the next Wayne Carey and <laughs> 22, I had no job and didn't know what to do. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then I, I got a job at an advertising agency and then not long after that, about eight months after that, I started my own marketing business and 13 years later, uh, it's called Bastion and Bastion's the largest independent marketing agency in the country. We've got offices in... Uh, the US in New York and LA, we've got office in Auckland and Melbourne and Sydney, we've got about 300 staff. Um, and so I'm the chairman of that and a couple of years ago I stepped out of being the CEO of that and, uh, and my brother who's been my partner, he taken over and so he runs the joint and uh, I've ended up being the CEO of the REACH Foundation which is a preventative youth mental health organisation which is just an awesome place to be. So. That's me. I think you were right in giving him the the summarization of himself because we couldn't have done a better job than that. Yeah, I know. And there's, pretty, uh, there's a lot to dive in. We've got AFL, we've got, you know, marketing and, you know, the biggest company, as we just said, independently in Australia. Um, the disarray at 22, 23, surely yeah, there would have been a, and there's a lot confused of, Fergus Watts. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that have had, you know, failed careers, including uh, yeah. a couple of boys right here. <laughs> uh, it's, in their it's, own it's, a comfortable, it's a comfortable room, you know, we're all in the, the public side. It's failure, but you, you've still achieved a fair bit. And obviously, Reach, which you're gonna, we're going to literally touch on all of those in that order. Let's go to the footy career to start because, um, like you said, you went pick 14. 14. I knew it was two picks before me. You got me there. <laughs> uh, pick 14 to the Crows uh, as, a, as a full forward or a centre half forward? Centre half forward, probably. What, Hybrid. At the time, yeah. What year are we? Uh, 2003 draft. 2003 draft. Yeah, yeah. That's a good draft, I think. That, who was no, that? it was a terrible draft. <laughs> it was 2009, Cooney, Adam Cooney was number one. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, think, think, I think it goes down as one of the worst drafts Kepler in history. Bradley's in there, isn't he? Yes. Oh, the Kepler, I, I think it's like one of the worst in the For history of the draft. It was the draft with Rebolt. <laughs> No, or that was that was two years jug. before. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that was two years before. And then, so in my draft, the dynamic of our draft was that the game really changed over that period, right? So the four years that I was in the system, the game changed from um, being more old school to being more modern day footy that you see now. So guys had to run a lot more. Um, you know, like when I, when I was drafted, it was all about – whether a big bloke could take a pack mark. And then by the time I was finished, it was how many entries you were getting above 27 and a half kilometres and how many tackles you could make in the forward line, you know? And it, it, it was just drastically changed. I remember sitting at a cafe in Brighton after a training session and we were um, at Brighton Grammar doing pre-season one year and I sit in the cafe reading the paper and the rule had come in where they changed the um, goal umpire. You didn't have to wait for the goal umpire to wave the flag anymore. When, you know, when they kicked a point. And I remember just distinctly sitting there going, 
this feels like it's going to make it hard. Yeah. You know, because that little 10 seconds, you know, like that's, you need that, yeah. right? Yeah. 105 that's kilo. Your brain was going. Mate, <laughs> 105 kilo key forward that struggles to get out of first gear. You need that break, <laughs> right? And I was like, my God, you can't, like, this is just going to keep flying up and down. And that, along with a bunch of other things, sure enough, like, the game just never stopped. And so from there, you had key forwards. Got phased out of the game, you know, pretty much. Um, it was all around speed. It was all about repeat efforts. It was all about forward pressure. Those things didn't exist really when I got drafted. Um, so that changed. So you look at guys um, that that were in that first round, and a lot of them were like me. They were designed for an old style of footy, and and you know didn't cut it in the new game. Mate, that was, just, that was your your kind of game, the the running game, the elite entries, and oh, not about the forward pressure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> forward pressure is good, but laying a tackle. Like, oh, yeah, but run. your kind of play, you can run up yeah. and down that wing all day long yeah, and just keep going and, and continually high efforts and stuff like that. So I used to go in and you know I'd go and kick five or six in the VFL. This is after I I, I got halfway through my last year at the Saints, and because uh, I broke my leg round two, played Eagles round one when I. Got back to the Saints, broke my leg round two, um, played a couple of games at the end of that year. It was something like a 20-week injury, and I came back after 12 or something thinking I was a hero <laughs> and just stupid. Busted. And then came back, had a heap of operation, missed that next preseason, just kept getting operation, kept having problems. The second half of that final year, I played a handful of games. And uh, and I was, you know, I'd go and, you know, I'd kick five, and then I'd kick four, and then I'd kick six, and I'd walk into the Every week, I'm like, am I going to get picked? Like, am I going to go, you know, because I'm 23rd man, always emergency, all this sort of stuff. And uh, and it and it continually came down to how many how many high entries can you get on your GPS results, oh, right? Oh, like, hey, you know, how many times you get over your 27 man. and a half? And I said, well, my top speed is 28. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> like Nick Rewalt and these blokes that I was playing with, their top speed is 32, 33, right? Yep. Maybe more. So they're getting above 27 30 times a game. I'm getting up there twice and one of those times was always when we ran from the huddle down to the goal square at the start of the game just to get a high entry you know yeah. and uh, you know it's just the way it was it was uh, it's just you know because if I didn't catch it I was useless because I just couldn't get going See, just, coach, yeah. they, they, com- they mix that up for like complacency but no that's actually my maximum effort is just less than everyone else it's also not a part of the game the GPS no one gives a fuck yeah. like, I got a mate well you've got a mate Viv Mitchie a good friend of ours like just at Freo like he couldn't get a game and they would review his GPS starter. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, but we'd play seconds together and he'd, he'd be best on ground every week. And the one thing that was keeping him out was his uh, sprint percentage. Yeah, it was and, exactly the same. And he's like, well, fuck, what do you want me to do? I've had 35 and been <laughs> best on ground six weeks in a row and <laughs> ended up winning the BNF and everything and then got shipped off to, to another club. But yeah, GPS, it's a, I don't know, if you're winning and, you, and you're playing your role, who gives a fuck in my eyes? It's just the way footy was. It probably still is, you know, but it's just, it definitely was then. And, and you know, like I was, like, I don't know. Do you remember your 20 motor sprint from the drive camp? Yeah, mine was ju- just like three. I could never get under three because I had a slow start good, but I got, when the long legs got going. Yeah, so, so the best is what, two, seven, two, eight. Oh, Everyone's yeah. sort of yeah. two, nine-ish, right? You're three. I was 3.3. Yeah. Like, yeah I, was, I couldn't I was, get going. I was three, one, five. Yeah. I wasn't quick. Like I could not get going, right? Yeah. Like I could run a reasonable beep test. Um, I could – Play, I could get myself in the right position. I was always my thing was I could read the play better. I was a I was like I could do the strategy of the game. I could always get in the right position. And uh, I remember speaking to um, Choco Williams, get, do an interview, um, the Port Adelaide coach at draft camp, and he said, "Mate, how can anyone draft you? Like you're you're so slow. Like <laughs> you know you're going to come up against Lepich or you're going to come up against these blokes, and you and you're so slow." And I said, "Well, the Lepich equivalent is." You know, whoever the centre half back is, who's currently seventeen or eighteen, that I'm playing against now. I said, "I got any problem beating them?" And he goes, "No." Nah. I said, "Well, it won't be an issue then, will it?" <laughs> and he goes, "Good point." Well, as it turned out, it was an issue. <laughs> <laughs> That's golden. He's pretty ruthless, Choco. I've heard him say some funny shit. You, you like, didn't work with him. Nah, he, I didn't. But I remember the one of the boys, older brothers, did, and they reckon. Um, at draft camp, he interviewed one of them and said, what was your favorite movie? And and one of the boys went, oh, Coach Carter. And he goes, oh, why is that? And he goes, oh, it's just an inspiring story. And um, yeah, really like, just touched me. You know? And he goes, 
it's a fucking shit movie. <laughs> they, just, they didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> and this young kid. They did, did they? Was, no, they didn't win. No, he's he's like, the bigger point of that like, movie then. It's like shit movie. Yeah, he know, was a beauty. I, I loved him. Oh, on draft day, because the draft was a bit different as now, but if the first round, or you look like you're going to go in the first round, you're invited to the draft. And I was at um, Rod Labour Arena in one of the little rooms out the side. And, um, and I got picked by Adelaide at 14 and Port Adelaide had picked 15. And, you know, the first draft happens really – the first round happens really quick. And then everyone sort of has a break and you do your media interviews and, and whatever else. And uh, Choco yells across the room, Missed you by one, what? <laughs> what a bloke. What a legend. Doesn't hold back, does it? No, I loved it, yeah. That's, that is brilliant. I mean, I don't want to just skip over the footy <coughs> career because we're going to talk it's about business today, but – it was a really tough time for you, wasn't it? Looking back, and you talk about all the injuries, and I mean, going so early in the draft, the you know the expectation from the public, um, they just feel the need they can just abuse you, uh, what, you know, when things aren't going your way. But let's just talk about that period, especially at Adelaide, um, and why it didn't work out there, and the injuries you did, you know, go through, and then the transition to Saints, and then obviously that's where it finished up. Yeah, well, um, the Crows, uh, so. I went over to the Crows and and it's a great club, the Crows. You know, it really is. And and it's a great club. It's full of great people. It had, you know, Neil Craig. Uh, Gary Ayers was a coach when I first got there and then he got the sack after my first game and then Craigie took over. And Neil Craig's a sensational coach and, you know, and I was um, looking back on it now in, in clear hindsight, I was a, I was, I was a kid that wanted everything too quickly and was complaining about everything I didn't get, you know, that's kind of the crux of it. Right. And so thought I was hard done by cause I wasn't getting selected and all this sort of stuff. And then I got wound up in my own head about, you know, where are my footy opportunities? My footy opportunities are going to be the same in, in two different States. Then where would I rather live? Right. And then got to the point where I'd, ra- I'd rather live in Melbourne cause my mates are there and all that sort of stuff. Right. And then, so I was talking to Grant Thomas at St Kilda and he was saying, I want you to, you know, we want you to be the full forward and, um, you know, we're going to push Rewild up the ground and put Cozzy in the ruck and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, so I'm saying, well, all right, so my, my footy opportunities are the same, if not better, at St Kilda. Um, here at the Crows, my, the footy opportunities are, are, are there. The reality is... Whoever drafts you, that's where you've got greater footy opportunities. That's the reality of the situation, and and the Crows are a great club. So I chose to leave, um, and 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 chose to leave and go go back to Melbourne, and and ended up getting traded to to St Kilda, um, and then yeah, the, the people of Adelaide are not mate fickle, not overly forgiving in that <laughs> in that scenario. <laughs> mate, very very loyal and very they turn you very well, quick so, at the same time. So yeah, you're in Adelaide. Yeah. Oh man, they're like they're, they're unbelievable when you're there, right? Yeah, unbelievable! Like the support you get and all that sort of stuff was was brilliant from from the Adelaide people and and playing S N F L is good and all that sort of stuff. S N F L is great footy, and uh, and then uh, Crows played the Eagles at a, in, a, in a final. I can't remember exactly it was a semi or something like that. I flew over to Perth as the travelling emergency, warmed up with the team before the game. Blah blah blah. No one got injured. I so then I flew back on the red eye that night and we. I was playing Woodville West Torrens versus uh, North Adelaide, I think, um, in a final at, at Amy Stadium at Footy Park the next day. So I flew back then. Crows got knocked out of the – they lost that game. They got knocked out of the finals with the Eagles. I kicked 10 in a final the next day. <laughs> oh, my God. Red eye, no sleep. Yeah. <laughs> the, ne- the, the, next, the next day, the front page of the, of the um, advertiser, you know, the future, Watts, you know, all this sort of stuff. The next day, I held a press conference and announced that. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't hold a pre- I had a press conference the, the the next day, and they were asking me, like, what's going on, what's going on? Two days later, it was announced I was leaving. Oh, right? my God. And, my God, did it get ugly from there. Because I then had to stick around and play four weeks of SNFL, three or four oh. weeks of, of SNFL finals, and just was that like, like Port, Port were out of the finals, Crows were out of the finals. There was no footy apart from the SNFL. And, yeah, mate, I was getting plastered. Like, just – 
I was getting yelled at and the show got spat on. I got, you know, like an old lady came up to me in a cafe and ripped me apart. Like, yeah. You know, and let alone the media, you know, the media stuff didn't bother me as much. It was the sort of the, the, the very direct, like, abuse from just yeah. a member of the public. <laughs> what did the old lady say to you? Oh, I said, I can't, something like, you know, who, who do you think you are and, you know, another traitor and all this sort of stuff. Um, but that, that kept going for years. Like, I would go back to Adelaide on business and I'd get in a cab and... <laughs> Like the cab driver would give me shit, you know. <laughs> like, like I remember going to the. I was at the Clare Valley races. I mean, ten years later, and I'm standing at the urinal, you know, at the races, and a bloke sidles up to me and starts ripping into me, you know, like a Crows fan. Like yeah. it, it was, you know. So it was sort of all. It's all funny now, and it was sort of funny at the time, but but it kind of wasn't as well. Like it really ingrains in your psyche some of that stuff as a young. I mean, I was 19, you know, or whatever, and then went to St Kilda. And and being then being traded for a first round pick to the Saints, and then uh, you know and then breaking my leg round two and barely playing again, and you go well, shit that was over pretty quickly and really didn't live up to any of the expectation that I had or anyone else had and throw some controversy in the middle, <laughs> you know it was a, it was a bit of a thing it, it stuck with me for a while a lot to take did were you sort of through that period especially when you did your leg and stuff were you starting to look elsewhere did you did you have any any other interests outside of footy or was it uh, nah no I, I, I no i i i did have interests outside of footy like footy to be honest and and i was injured most of the time so i'm training by myself you know you're on the it's rehab the bike you all that sort of stuff right so so I fell out of love with footy pretty quickly, right? So I wasn't – it's not like I was sitting there going, yeah, I really want another contract. Like I was done at the end. I um, I um, My very last game for, for Casey in the VFL, I um, was running back with the flight of the ball and dove forward to catch it and a guy was coming through the other way, knee hit my jaw, broke my jaw in two places and sort of snapped it off and, and whatever. So in the last game of footy, that happened to me. I then went – and uh, had an operation the next day to fix the jaw. Four days or five days later, whatever it was, I went and had another op on my ankle. And then five days after that or six days after that, um, I get a call from the receptionist at St Kilda saying, you know, Ross wants to see you. Ross Lyon, the coach, he wants to see you. And I was like, oh, okay, like this is it. So I go into the footy room, crutches, jaw like the size of a football and walk in. And all the coaches are there and everyone else sitting around the boardroom table and I walk in, sort of stumble in and whatever, sit down and Ross goes, um, so obviously it's not great news. I said, no. Nah. He goes, you know why we're here? I said, yeah. He goes, got any questions? I said, no. Nah. He goes, all right then, see you later. <laughs> that was oh, it. So we're both yeah. listed, both and, Ross Lyon. You were done then, weren't you? Yeah, you're mad. Yeah, mate, I, yeah. I was done. Like, yeah. you know, and um, and plus my leg, I, like, my, I couldn't play anymore because of my leg. But I was just over it, you know. So so did I have any interest outside of footy? No, not really. But at the same time, I didn't want to be in footy, so I had to do something else. Yeah. Do you look do you look back and is there anything obviously it's shaped who you are and there's a lot of things that you know, everything happens for a reason, but is there anything that you look back on and go, fuck, I wish I did something a little bit differently? Or nah, you're um, like it is what it is and I'm moving forward. I probably wouldn't have left the crows. Yeah. Like if I had, you know, if I'm advising my 19 year old self again, I, I would have signed the three year deal that was on the table at the Crows and, and just stayed there. And that, just because that's that would have been the best way to see through every football opportunity or all the football opportunities I had, right? Like I would have had the better opportunities there. Um, so I probably wouldn't have done that because it would have given my footy a, um, you know, every chance. In saying that, if I break my leg round two, against the crow you know with, with the crows like in the same way it would have all ended the same anyway so um so it's a bit of an unknown outside of that um you know i like to think my my certainly my recollection of it is i tried to do everything right right i tried to eat right i did the training right the rehab right i tried to be the perfect professional you know and um and and I think that's the only way to be, you know, in my view, is try and really do it and, and get it right. Um, could have taken the pressure off a bit. Like Thursday sucked, you know. You don't get picked on a Thursday oh. and all that stuff. Like the, all that shit. But it is what it is, you the, know. The, um, the 23rd man, I've done it a lot. I don't know, I don't know what it's like in soccer, but it, it is frustrating, isn't it? Because you're actually you're in – like talk about the group. You're actually amongst the group internally. You're like you're in the ones. But you're not. So as soon as the ball's bounced, you're the guy in the race. You know, you're the guy that 
gets around the boys when they lose or win and you, you're not sweaty, but you're kind of in all the meetings, you're in all the prep, you're in all the reviews. The next week you've got to go play seconds. You might dominate and then someone else goes above you and you're like, fuck, how does that happen? And mm -hmm. there's, that, that part of the game is super frustrating, isn't it? It's a killer. Yeah, the the Thursday thing that the, the, so in my second year at Adelaide, I was emergency for I don't know eight weeks in a row, like whatever you know, a lot. Um, and same thing, like you say, it's like you're in the you, you know you feel like you're part of it, but you're not part of it, you right? And you start wanting you you start not minding if blokes don't play well. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's well, it's the unsung rule. Someone to play shit to yeah, get well, a game. it's the only way. You're like, if he drops that, well, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, well, gets that. Now, 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 more of a sniff. You know, yeah. what I mean? if I'm wearing yeah. the same well, jersey. That's, that's the reality of yeah, it, right? It is. And it's it's, it's the reality of the situation. And then, I, I was playing against Port Adelaide in the SANFL, and Clive Waterhouse. Remember him? Yeah, yeah. yeah the big seller. Clive Waterhouse. I bent down to pick the ball up. Clive Waterhouse comes steaming through, and he was quick and solid. He comes steaming through, and takes my leg out, okay. and ruptured my ankle. And I just didn't tell anyone. So I was like, there is no way I'm emergency for eight or nine weeks or whatever it was in a row. And don't get a kid. Like, and now I'm going to get injured? Like, not a chance, right? So I didn't tell anyone. And I'd steal tape from, you know, like they'd strap my ankles or something. I'd just go and take some more. And I'd strap my ankle every session, every game to a point where I just couldn't move it and play for another five or six or seven weeks. And then got to a point where I just couldn't walk down the street anymore. Like my leg was just <laughs> flopping over, right? Like, and and I was like, I, like I've got to tell someone now. Yeah. It turns out I ruptured. Like, there's six ligaments in your ankle, and I'd ruptured four of them. You know, and this ankle was just sort of hanging on. And but it was like, you know. And then after the five or six weeks, I've been playing through pain and not telling anyone, holding this big secret and everything else. And probably the reason why I, I ripped the shit out of my ankle the following year, so I'm ankle. I was still emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Oh oh it's like, God. oh, it just is a killer. But it's crazy when you're that age though, because I went through something very similar. I played in a stress fracture for a whole season, didn't tell anyone because I was coming off the bench. I'm like, yeah. oh, now's the At 19, I'm thinking, nah, I'll be right. I couldn't walk for six months after it. The long it's, yeah, it's just ridiculous. And the long-term stuff you do is shocking. You know, I'm 36 now, my ankle's terrible. Yeah. And it just is what it is. On the um, the flip side of Tommy's question, because you've obviously had a very um, accomplished business career and some ventures now that you're doing, which we'll touch on, but from just the footy career or the sporting career, anything that actually has assisted you to kind of give you some foundations or set you up, transferable skills so far? Um, I reckon the biggest thing that's assisted me is that I failed in my sport career. Yeah. So by, by failing as a footballer, and doing it quite publicly and copping the shit that I copped and all that sort of stuff. It gave me a base where it's like, it's okay to fail. You know, before that it was a, it was a, it's not okay to fail. Um, it, things are going to be a problem, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now it's like, well, you know, what are you going to do? You start a business and it fails and like big deal, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so that was the, that was the greatest thing. Cause, cause I see so much in business that people, either be too scared to start and so they never do or they spend months and months and months doing strategy and you know all this stuff to try and get it perfect and the reality is is never perfect ever and so all these months and months and months of strategy I reckon in the first session like the first two hours of a strategy session you're 80% of the way there you know mm -hmm. so just start you know and if you get it wrong you get it wrong and that so that's been the greatest lesson that I've had um, that's set me up as a sort of a baseline to be able to grow from. That's fantastic. It's great advice. It is great advice. And this is where we're now going to talk business because, um, and we'll start with Bastion because what you've been able to do uh, at 20, well, I guess it was 22 when you started, obviously publicly it says 23, but at 22 years of age, you've decided to um, to start your own business. And uh, like, talk to me about how that actually, that, that moment where you go, no, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start my own company. And then, you know, all the things that come from that. And now what it is, obviously, one of the largest uh, independent marketing companies in Australia, if not the, the biggest ever, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think it is. It's hard to, hard to know exactly, but I I think it I'll might. go with it. I think Definitely. it is. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> it, it it's a money podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened? Like you finished footy and going, nah, I'm going to test nah. the waters and then. Yeah, mate, it's like. Yeah, right. I was I was speaking at a thing the other night, and uh, someone said, "You know, what was your plan?" You know, there was no plan. Like <laughs> it's just it was just get going, you know. And I I was working at this great company. Uh, it was an advertising business, and they were merging these two businesses together. And and the 
the biggest thing that dawned on me was sort of the way the peop- the role of people play in this. Because when you look at a business and the corporate identities and you look at, you know, cost cutting and all these sort of things, it's like reality is these are human beings that do the work, right? And so you've got to get them motivated and engaged and, and everything else. And so that was the premise of it. I, I thought I could go out and uh, I, and I was no expert in anything, right? Like I didn't know how to do anything really. So I figure I can go out and find people who are experts at something and then I can help build a business around them. Because just because you're an expert at something, if you're a great chef, doesn't mean you're going to be a great restaurateur, right? Mm. If, if you're a great artist, doesn't mean you're going to be a great business person. If you're a good digital marketer, doesn't mean you're going to build a good digital marketing business because the business side of it is a whole bunch of other stuff that goes with that rather than just delivering the service. So I thought, I can't deliver a service of any type because I don't know what I'm doing, but there's tons of people out there who are experts at that and don't know what they're doing in the business stuff. I'll learn the business stuff real quickly and figure it all out and we'll sell some stuff and then go from there. And that was kind of the premise of how it started. Um, and then, so I started, I found, found a guy who uh, had a digital marketing business, did that. Um, I, I got a couple of clients, um, just to pay the bills and, uh, and keep that going. We had an email marketing company. We had a couple of others. Um, then an opportunity came up to buy a PR agency. And so I, I had a little apartment in, uh, in Melbourne and, and sold that and then bought my share of the PR business. And then. I re-approached my old boss, said, you'd hate it here, why don't you come over here and we'll start an advertising business, and that's what we did, and, you know, so on and so forth, and and that's kind of how it grew, and, and like, it has, certainly hasn't been a linear projection of, you know, all good stuff and growth, there's been tons of hard times, nearly gone bust a bunch of times, like, we've pushed it, we've flown way too close to the sun enough, like, you know, like, <laughs> lots of that sort of stuff that's that's got there, but, you know, we are where we are today. That's that's incredible. So those early days, <clears throat> particularly for you, it's quite um quite bold to think I'll just pick up the business game and, and get the uh the crafty sort of yeah, but, team in. But mate, I was a kid, like I was twenty two. I had no responsibility, I'd no nothing. Like you could start I was twenty two, so I thought I knew everything about everything. I thought I was a hero. I thought I could just walk into any room and sell anything to anyone. I didn't know what I didn't know, which was a lot. And if it all went bad, well, big deal. I'll go get a job doing something else, you know. And so I, I don't think it was that bold, you know. And I actually don't think when you really get your head around starting a business, I, I don't think it's the starting of the business that is a bold move. I think it is the, the starting of the business generally you can get it together, right? If you're in a service game, you've generally got a couple of clients you can take with you that'll pay the bills. If you want to start a cafe or a restaurant or anything, as long as you can pull whatever is required to get together to start, you can start, right? It's the bits down the line. It's the it's the bits where, you, where you've got to take the next evolution of growth. It's the bit where you've got to go to the next level. It's the bit where you've got to hire a few more staff. It's the bit where you've got to start paying someone more than you get paid because they're going to be able to take, you know, take a whole bunch of stuff off your hands and build it to the next level. It's the bit where you remove your ego out of it and, you, you know, all that sort of stuff, take some bigger risks. Like those things happen all the time and there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity to bail out throughout the period and you know that that is where i think boldness in business comes what sort of got you through those those early days then for you in particular when you were there because i assume you're you're learning on the fly day by day moving with the flow of it mm. were you were you sort of you know channeling some sort of thoughts with people mentors or what was sort of your process there through um uh so my old man's been my mentor was my mentor for for you know, a lot of my business career. Saints man as well, I might add there, Tommy. Yes, yes. had a stint at the Saints. Um, so he, you know, so he, he's been unbelievable for me and my development, right, and being able to have someone that you can bounce off and ask questions to, especially when, for me, I mean, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, right? So so that was all really good. Outside of that, I've, I've been a believer in just backing my own judgment. Right. So listening to everyone, ask a bunch of questions, gather a whole heap of information from anyone you can, but do it your way. And that's always been my thing. Like I'm, I'm, re- I'm really against like, you know, oh, my mentor said to do this, so I'm going to do, I'm going to do it this way. Or, you know, I was talking to that guy, listen to this podcast and he said to do this, so that's what I'm going to do. That's 
bullshit because you can't be him and you can't be your mentor and you can't be some guy on a podcast. You can only be you. So all you can do, in my view, to be successful is listen to everyone, take all the big, all the bits that service you, leave all the shit that doesn't, and then go and do it your way. And if your way is wrong, well, so be it. It's wrong. But in my view, it's the only way to lead and it's the only way to live your life. Mate, it's special. So just the marketing um, or bashed in itself, what, for the listeners, what are the actual sort of service offerings that you guys would typically give clients? So we do the full breadth of marketing services. So it'll it's advertising, um, so creative advertising, TV advertising, outdoor advertising, digital advertising, all that sort of stuff. It's public relations, so PR, so stuff that you read in the paper um, that's sort of promoted um, is what, what PR is. Um, content, so we make videos and, and social media videos and TV ads and everything else. We do research, so, you know, ask you any question about anything and gather all the research insights. Um, we have a 100,000-person database where we can ask them any question they want about anything. Um, we do crisis management, reputation management, you know, anything with digital transformation, anything within this sort of marketing services mix, we do. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what's for, cause we've had a lot of young entrepreneurs come on that have, have got a lot of great branding and a lot of sort of good marketing and some of them really, the marketing has been a big part of their success for some people who are starting out their business, potentially for you with your sort of visibility across that. What are some of the, I guess, common pitfalls, maybe some, you know, early businesses have with their marketing and their branding? Um, I would say... The only way to be a, a true brand, the whole thing about branding is the ability to connect, connect emotive values. That's it, right? So I stand for this. I believe in this. You believe in something similar. And so we connect. Same way you do with a friend, same way you do with anyone in your life, right? You, you don't connect with people who have differing values or differing beliefs. You don't have that emotive connection. And when you meet people who do, you know pretty on, pretty instantly that you connect on the same level. A brand is the same, right? So businesses too often, I think, try and create something for everyone. It's like you don't need to sell stuff to everybody. You just need to sell stuff to the people that are going to buy your stuff. That's <laughs> it. So just be you, right? Set a belief. What do you stand for as an organization? Um, what are you all about? What's important to you? And then do it. And if and and well, and then say it. That's what marketing is. Say it and promote it, right? Um and most businesses now, I mean, to go and buy TV ads or do mainstream sort of media, you, you need a huge amount of dough. And it's, it, you know, if you're a big organization, then great. You can go do that stuff. You can you can buy market share. All that stuff's great. If you're not, if you're a small business, you can't buy that stuff. So you've got to do it then through your own, your own channels. So social is really good for that. Your own content channels, all that sort of stuff. So you got to do is just speak your mind, you know, just, just. Talk about what you believe in, be consistent about what you believe in and do it. And there'll be enough people out there, if you're strong enough and you're emotively connect enough, there'll be enough people out there that, that connect back. Love that. Yeah, it's great feedback because people think that marketing, you know, like you said, it's it, it, it's becoming harder and harder. So people just think you can do the same thing that everyone's doing. And like you said, the reality is it's, it's not true because it's so hard to amplify something with a small budget, you know, and you, it's, there's no point even doing that for a small brand is there because you just can't compete. Well, totally. And But it's like you guys doing this, right? So you, you've got a podcast. Now, Now you don't need everyone in the country or the world to listen to this podcast, right? If you did, I mean, you would be the most successful media outlet that's ever existed, right? So you don't need that. You need a fraction of the population to be heavily emotively engaged in what you do. So if you came here and you were not yourselves and you spoke – sort of um, you spoke in a way that wasn't true to yourself and of the heart and and really core to your soul, well, the listeners would see through that. They'd pick that stuff up and they'd go, no, these bikes aren't for real or I'm not connecting to that, you know, and, and they go, I'm not really feeling that because you're not feeling it either because you're yeah. trying to be something you're not, right? Yeah. You guys don't do that. You yourselves, you speak well, you, you, you speak as you are. And so there's enough people out there that will connect to that, you know, and it's it's that intrinsic underlying emotive connection that that's 
that's the bit that matters. Would your um, would Bastion kind of uh, challenge businesses on that? Maybe you know if they're pushing maybe an identity that you think is probably yeah not working. Would you guys? Yeah, 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 totally. Those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, a, a lot of the time, because we work for big companies, right? Like a Microsoft or whatever. Right? So 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 big organisations, um, and so they you know because of that they've got a very diverse customer base, and you know they sell a bunch of stuff to a bunch of people. Um, so in marketing, they talk about customer insights, right? So what's the, what's the true insight here? Are you missing the insight? What do people actually care about? Um, and so, yeah, so a big part of, part of the job um, of an agency, of a marketing agency, is to do all that sort of stuff, is to get to those customer insights. Because in a small business, it's easy because it's about you, yeah. right? If you're building a brand, you're building the Aces brand and you've got a thousand people running a thousand different podcasts. They need to unify around one brand, but they need to then execute it in their own way with their own sort of personality and all that sort of stuff. So that then that takes a, a fair bit of um, of expertise to be able to pull that sort of stuff together. Key talking points, key messaging. What do we all believe that's unified, and how do we differ for per audience? You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's a yeah big chunk of what we do. Would also because um, for for that point the internal values as well because obviously obviously the companies like Microsoft will have their internal values their corporate sort of beliefs as such that they want to get everyone on board on. Would you guys be doing that? You know the internal aspect and operation as well. Yeah, all the same. Yeah, yeah. That's external good. internal. Uh, it, it's how hard? How hard is that when businesses scale to kind of keep that uh, tough? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's hard because. Uh, it's hard because there's a whole bunch of very personal dynamics involved, right? Mm. So um, to build a business of size, there's a whole bunch of stuff you got to do. Occasionally you got to let people go, you know, occasionally people, well, often, not often, occasionally people aren't, aren't happy in their job, right? You know, often people think they should be paid more than they're currently getting paid, you know, like there's all these different dynamics involved. You got people that go on, you know, have a you know they 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 got a they have a new child, and so they're stressed about a whole bunch of other dynamics that aren't their life. They bust up with a partner. They've got all these other personal things going on in their life, and then they turn up to work, and they're and they're meant to believe in the mission of the organisation. You know, and for a big business, it can be hard sometimes because it, the, the reality is the mission gets diluted as it goes down. Yeah. Um, you know, the really good ones like the Googles and the Apples and those sort of stuff. I mean, they have, they've got like a godlike figure to the whole thing, you know, and the brand. And so people bleed for the brand, you know. Yeah. Most businesses, that's not overly attainable, but that's what, you've, that's what you're fighting for. But you, you are fighting for or through a whole bunch of conflicting personal stuff that generally goes with that as well. Just on that, I heard that um, in a bit of prep here, but that you – you know, you, there is a bit of a um, saying with footy, leave your ego at the door, park it at the door and, you know, walk in. And, and you're of the opinion that, you know, that's that's bullshit. Um, did you want to touch on that and also the, you know, the way that you run your business? You've got a few rules that I've heard you say publicly, but just how you kind of approach your business and leave as well, I found quite fascinating. So um, ego is an interesting one. Ego, ego can be the worst thing in the world. Uh, and it can be a very good thing as well, right? Because the the ego of successful people is enormous, right? So it it is the drive to keep going. But untamed ego with an inability to understand the emotions behind that and an inability to understand why, you know, you're feeling how you're feeling and being governed by your ego, that can be hugely detrimental in building a business. A lot of the time people like, I speak to people all the time and I say, well, you got to pay that guy more than you pay yourself. Oh, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then why? Well, what's more important, building the business or you being the top dog, you know? Yeah. Um, and mo- a lot of people really struggle with that, you know? Like I struggle with it. In the last couple of years as I stepped out of being the CEO of Bastion, it's amazing how quickly you get forgotten, you know? And you walk into the office and like, yeah, you're filling up a cup of tea at the tap and you go, oh, yeah, mate, how you doing? You know, what's your name? And he goes, you know, who are you? Has that happened? Oh, that is unbelievable. Yeah. So that, that stuff happens all the time. And in one way you go, 
That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. this place now operates without me and I'm unrequired and what a luxury that is. And, you know, isn't Jack, my brother, doing such a great job because of that and all that sort of stuff. And in the other time, you go, what the fuck do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> you know? I'm 22 when I started yeah. this bad Jack, boy. Like, this fucking- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, like so So you've got to, you know, and, and those sort of things, like there's been many times over the last couple of years where I could have easily gone – no, nah, like like this emotion, this I got to swallow my ego on this. I'm too proud, you know. All these sort of emotions that can be really detrimental to getting get in the way of 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 evolution. There was many times where I could have gone, no, nah, I got to get back in here, right? And you see it all the time with founders getting back involved in the business or people that were out now get back in and all that sort of stuff. It's all emotive ego and it's a lack of understanding. So I've often had to go and sort of take that really think about it, maybe go get a coffee or sit by myself for a while and go, why have I reacted like that? Why am I thinking like that? What is the emotion that's driving that? And then getting to the point saying, do I really care? You know? And if I do care, then I've got to do something about it. If I don't care and it's just ego and bullshit, you've got to let it go. You know? And you've got to suck it up. And I mean, I, I do that on a very often basis. When did you start doing that? That self-awareness? Because I assume, yeah. yeah, that's really good. Good skills. Well, so now I'm the CEO of the Reach Foundation, right? The Reach Foundation does this, develops these skills in young people to develop preventative mental health solutions, right? So I started out as a young person in in, in one of the programs at Reach when I was 15. Developed that, was a crew member at Reach, was you know did the facilitator training, would go out and run workshops um, as a facilitator for for young people, and so I would do though you know like I would develop these skills. So what we do at Reach is we develop um, social and emotional resilience skills for young people, right? We do that. The two core protective factors in developing strong mental health or protecting ill mental health is a good understanding of yourself and a good understanding of those around you, right? They're the two, there's a whole bunch of other science that goes into it, but they're the two core factors that that work with. So if you have a, a really solid understanding of yourself, who you are, what makes you tick, um, emotively why you do what you do, and ability to sort of intrinsically self-analyze, you're in a very strong mental health position where you can take advantage of positive things that come your way and move forward in your life. And when shit goes bad, you're in a better position to be able to deal with the issues of those. Exactly the same way I just described then. And not spiral out of control, right? Mm -hmm. What we also do at Reach is we do it in group work, right? So all of our workshops are with groups of anywhere between 60 and 400 young people at a time. And what the group work does is the group work allows you to get a better understanding of those around you, right? Because you can self-analyze all you want, but if you know nothing about the community or nothing, nothing about those around you, you can't, it's, it's, it's hard to get a gauge and a read on what's normal, right? So you sit in a group and you go, actually, you're talking about some real stuff and you're self-analyzing now and I'm hearing you and I'm saying, well, shit, I'm not alone and you're doing the same. And I said, well, actually, I'm not that different now that we're, you know, we're doing this. So through that, you get a better understanding of self, uh, of those around you, and you get a better understanding of yourself. That work through the developing mind from a 13-year-old to an 18-year-old or, or older that sets you up for a really strong life. And I've been doing that since I was 15. That's very powerful. Just before we jump into Reach, um, because it is an amazing organisation, and it's funny, but we've done a bit of research then, clearly, because I think the flip of what Tommy said with the ego thing, which was really, really impressive how you put it, um, one thing I found interesting that you said, because there's a saying in business like, leave emotion at the door. But I think I, I read something about you saying that no emotion, like if you don't have emotion, you don't care about your business because caring is, is an emotion and you should totally. care about your business. So. Mate, I've never known anyone to leave their emotion at the door, ever. Yeah. It's horse shit. It's like some old <laughs> thing that old blokes used to say because it, you know. Jesus, hard. <laughs> <laughs> Who does it? Like, honestly. At a footy club, it, I mean, that's why I, that was the thing I picked up as well, but it's kind of. You know, when you walk in the door, that was kind of the thing, wasn't it? Um, but yeah. no one does it. No can, one does it's it. It's fake. You and can you can't play it. good footy without emotion. Yeah. And you can't be a good business person without emotion. And you can't be anything. You can't be a good human being without your emotion. So leave emotion at the door. It's just moronic, right? If it's emotionless, you probably shouldn't be doing it, really. Yeah. Well, exactly. It means you don't care about it, right? Yeah. It means you're not engaged. It means you know, all that sort of stuff. It's And, and like, 
you know, like you go through periods and, and I've done it a number of times where, you know, you got to make people redundant or you got to move them on. Or you gotta, like that is an emotional thing. It really is, you know. So it's a hard thing to do. It impacts people's livelihoods. It's, you know, and so the old school way of, do, of saying that would be leave the emotion at the door. It's it's not personal. It's business. <laughs> you know, it just is what it is. <laughs> don't do it and move on. Now, the logistical requirement most of the time is the best way to do it for the for for both, you know, the person who's receiving the and the person who's giving the information is to just say, be very direct, say, look, this is the way it is, this is what's happening, this is the decision we make, um, understand this is tough and move on. Logistically, that's the way it is. But emotively, this is just not a reality. Mm. You know, emotively, I can't imagine, there's got to be no boss in the world that doesn't get butterflies in their stomach and feel shitty about it and any of those sort of things. But Again, if you don't recognize that and you don't deal with that, then what you do is you come out like, you know, you're really too heavy, you know, when you give the message. It's too over the top and the person goes, fucking whoa, like you're just throwing my world upside down and you're yelling at me about it, you know? Yeah. Like, so you've got to understand the emotion. You've got to you've got to benefit from the emotion and you've got to work through what that emotion is because that's the only way you can ever actually deliver something and either it's something negative like that or it's something positive where you're trying to sell. If you're selling and you're over the top selling because you can't control your emotion because you need the sale or you're too excited <laughs> or whatever <laughs> and you can't control that, then the person on the other side goes, whoa, you know, like, fuck, I'm not feeling this. <laughs> Whereas if you come in, you know, you, you, you build rapport, you, you mirror their body language, um, you know, you speak at the level they speak at, you raise to the level they're raising at, and you create that connectivity and that emotive connectivity, you're much more likely then to sell something, you know, and they're the rules that work, you know, so it's all emotive based. It's it's great that you just shared that. It's, um, it's I mean, for a salesman out there, they'd be loving it. I just want to ask you a quick question on this because you would have done it a lot of times. When you have to when you have to suck someone, what is the perfect way to do it? Because a lot of people out there listening will have to deal with this. And you just touched on, you know, what not to do. But I mean, there's probably no perfect way of doing it, but when you have done it and you've seen the best result for both parties, what kind of what, what was said? Uh, there is no perfect way to do it because because the impact that it has on people is significant. Yeah. Right. And that should never be downplayed. Is and I, you know, I've been lucky that I've had to do it a few times, but like not often, right? And um, so the impact that it has on people is is significant and it impacts their livelihoods, it impacts their families, all that sort of stuff. And so that should never be downplayed, right? So that's that's the the first thing is you got to recognise that and 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 deal with that. But there is a reality to it is that that's the decision you made in the best interest of the business. And so you have to give that information honestly, directly, and and as soon as you can. If you drag it out, it's like, you know, oh, we'll drag this out another month or we won't, you know. We'll, everyone knows. It starts to, you know, things either leak out or it becomes <coughs> obvious because, you know, no one can hide it or whatever else. So be honest, be direct, deliver it as soon as you can, um, and then move on. You know, and that's that's the thing. Do you get much follow up from when when, when that does happen, or is it kind of run under like you know? I, I can't I imagine following it. up, but like, does people ever As go? If someone's going back and you go, yeah. Oh, like, does help. anyone come back at you? And then you know, and, yeah. and you just gotta you just gotta wear that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it'd be no different to being dropped. In, yeah, yeah. It'd be no. I mean, footy yeah, would set you up. It's like, stuff, what are you doing? It? You're gonna tell someone something they don't want to hear. You know, and and you know, sometimes people go, "Yep, I understand." I understand there's a decision you've got to make. I don't like it, but, you know, yep. A lot of the time, you know, the person doesn't like, doesn't want to be there anyway, you know. That's yeah. why it's not working a lot of the time. Um, but, yeah, occasionally you get told you're a prick, you know. And, and, again, you can't – it's one of those things. You can sit there and your ego sort of revs up and it's like, no, nah, like, that's not right. Mm. It doesn't serve a purpose, so you just got to go, yeah, I hear you. I understand this is tough. Yeah. There you go. Well, great feedback for, um, great, uh, you know, education for anyone out there that wants to, to sack someone. There's no Sounds right or wrong way to do it. It is it? because I've never, never no, done we, it. We've never, never want to do it. But yeah. um, it's never asked a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's another one yeah. as well. Um, I want to talk about the culture of Bastion before we, we go down the track now and talk about reach after Bastion, but what you've created, um, 
you know, and also who you've created it with. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind you sharing um, who's involved, but talk about the culture that you've set up and I guess the correlation between your sporting career um, and what you liked and didn't like and how you've taken that into Bastion. Um, culture, we've got three rules. One is make each other's lives better. Now, it doesn't mean make each other's lives easier because running a business and delivering good work and especially in the agency game, it's not easy. It's hard. You know, it, it's it's continually hard, continually improving. You've got lots of clients. You've got competing interests. It's difficult. But growth through challenge makes you better. So let's make each other's lives better. That's number one. Number two is produce world-class work that's better every time. So continual high performance, continual improvement. Can't train the same way twice. Um, you know, everything needs to be elite at what we do and the best of the best always and continually improving. Um, and that's number two. And number three is create and run, you know, good commercial businesses. So unapologetically commercial, be profitable, um, run good commercial organizations. Otherwise, the business just is in, in a, in a um, tough situation if you don't have good cash flow and you don't have good P&Ls and all those sort of things because you can never get ahead. So they're the three rules, right? So we build a culture around that. Um, and we've done all sorts of stuff. We've brought in, I mean, five years ago or six years ago, we brought in unlimited leave. So if you've been with us for a period of time, then you can have unlimited leave, you know, and, and there's no, you don't have to worry about your four weeks every year and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, so some, it's, a, it's a culture really built on on trust, you know, and that's, that's something that's been really important the whole time. Um, but also fun, you know, and being able to have fun, being able to, uh, you know, being in, engaged in your work, um, all that sort of stuff, that that builds an important important culture. Um, so yeah, that's been the, the, around those three rules has been what's important to us the whole time. That's um pretty powerful. Without going into numbers or the commercials, just are you able to give us insight on maybe like one of the first big clients you got where you went home that day and thought, oh shit, we could be onto something here. Um, yeah, so real early days. So my brother started the sponsorship business. With a sponsorship division within our group and he was selling surfing events for Surfing Victoria. Uh, this is, I don't know, 11 years ago. He's selling surfing surfing events. So he's flying down to Torquay, selling the Longboard Pro or the Rip Curl Pro or any of this sort of stuff, right? And he was in our office in South Melbourne and he, and he came back one day and he said, you know what, every time I go in and I, I, I try and sell this stuff, he goes, I talk about surfing and I get them all juiced up and, you know, buy a surfing asset and they're all sort of excited by it. And then they go, they go you know, well, how am I going to activate the partnership? And he goes, I don't know what activation is. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, fuck, I don't know what activation is either. I said, but I've got an advertising agency over here. Maybe they do. And then so I spoke to the guy and he's like, yeah, of course I know what activation is. Like we're ex we're marketing people. Um, you know, activating is when you're, when you're, sponsor an event, like at the tennis, you know, and there's all those marquees and you can go in and get your L'Oreal bag or your Kia, you know, experience or whatever. That's what activating it is. And so I said, oh, well, you should go and pitch with him and go in there and, and, and you know, sponsorship and activation. I said, and we've got a PR company over here. Maybe you could tie them in and they'll do the PR around it so you get more promotion. of that. And so we did. And then we signed um, – Nature Valley Muesli Bars in what was one of the largest sponsorships in surfing history. Oh, yeah. And so then I went, right, hang on, this kind of works. You know, if you get these different divisions that we had going and these different services actually working together and being able to provide what is called an integrated solution, it's easier for brands to buy. It's better for all our businesses because they got a better pipeline of work to win. They're more efficient in the way they deliver it. And at the end of the day, the whole solution's better for the client and they'll rehire you. And that was kind of the light bulb where I went, right, hang on. It's not just about having different services. It's about having different services that can truly work together and provide an integrated solution. And that's what's been uniquely different about Bastion is that we are, we've got these integrated complementary services where a lot of our competitors, the big holding companies, all that sort of stuff, they'll own... 10 PR agencies that all compete against each other, you know, whereas we don't have any of that. It's all complementary. Um, we talk about thinking wide, so you've got wide breadth of service, but then we've got very deep expertise. So we don't have one PR person there who dabbles in PR but really does something else. We have 30 of them, and they're experts in PR, and all they do is PR, but they work with 
the wide breadth of services within the group to provide a solution to the client. It's brilliant. It's it's exactly what you want as a as a brand, really, isn't it? Just come to Bastion and you guys have got all the services. When you when you've grown the business from what you just said, you know, the three tiers there to what it is now, how many how many is it? Ten or eleven, twelve? How many like specialist services have you got oh. within Bastion? Uh, yeah, 12 maybe. Yeah, yeah, so when you, you yeah, when you go from three to 12 and every time you, you know, you could probably acquire a new one, it, like, is it, is it hard work? Yeah. Like, what goes into just, you know, maybe that next step? Um, there's a whole bunch of logistical stuff around, around like the integration of it. You got to integrate all the back end stuff, the HR, the, 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 um, processes, all that sort of stuff. It's all sort of boring business stuff that really matters but it's not sexy. The um, the big thing I found was cultural integration. So like people who are attracted to research are a different type of person and a different personality to those that are attracted to sports sponsorship, yeah. right? And yeah. they're different again to those who are attracted to advertising, right? They're just different types of people into different stuff and they've – attracted, you know, like your research person, much more diligent, most of the time a lot more introverted, quieter, sports sponsorship guys, you know. Carrying on. Charismatic <laughs> ego. Yeah, right. Get me in there. Um, <laughs> and so finding the connection to those, um, I always thought it was a, a – it's okay, just everyone, there's no judgment here. Everyone just be themselves and that'll be all right, right? Now, that is okay for people like me that feel comfortable in most rooms and could be happy doing what they're doing and just be, right? It's not okay for a more introverted, um, quieter person who who needs, you know, doesn't feel comfortable in those environments. So just saying, you know, make each other's lives better, we're all here, like just – you know, do what you do, the introverted person comes in and goes, shit, uh, you know, like there's 20 people over here that are loud, that are obnoxious, that are carrying on. It's just, oh, this is very uncomfortable for me. And it took me a while to figure that out, right? And I had to get told it. I probably had to get told it five times from people within the business because I was like, what do you mean? Like, just be you, you know? Um, so that cultural integration was really important because you had to do things that was, you know, instead of going for Friday night beers, you had to do something that was different or do it in a different environment or, you know, you had to actively make the environment suitable and effective for everybody. Um, and those things, those things were, um, we didn't get right early, you know, like we really didn't get it right. And, and it used to really piss me off, you know, I was like, what do you mean? Like, just get on with it, you know? And um, I remember there's a very different culture between our PR business when we acquired that to our sponsorship business or our advertising business, you know. And I was like, why can't everyone just get on? Like, you know, and it, it used to drive me mad, but it's just, it was all because of me, you know, because I wasn't creating an environment that suited everybody or had had pockets of that environment that people could feel comfortable in and be themselves. How did you create it? Um, scale helps. So the bigger you get, the easier that is because the dilution effect of scale means that no one's necessarily overpowering or no one group's more or less than another. So that helps. Um, but, you know, we did it through actively changing activities, changing the way we did things, um, you know, like just just listening. You know, it was the first time we ever ran a staff survey. It was like five or six years into the thing, you know, and it's like, you know, we, we listened to people. We, we, we actively changed because it was really important to us that everyone felt really comfortable, you know, and now we've got, um, you know, then that, when, when you get that right commercially as the business owner, you've got people actually working together across the different disciplines that then can go and provide. So you get your better cross sell rates and all that sort of stuff. And so, it commercially it, it wins out, you know, and you had to just suck it up. Like it's goes that ego thing before. Like I had to suck it up and go what I was doing and I prided myself on culture. I prided myself on, on, you know, making each other's lives better and that this was an amazing place to work and all that. And I was being told it wasn't. And I had to cop that, you know, it was a hard thing to do. And again, I didn't get it right first time. It's not like someone told me and I immediately reacted. I, I had to get told a bunch of times. I had to go through a bunch of shit um, you know, and I have to put the ego aside and go, yeah, actually, culture in this place is not that good right now and, and actively change it. 
just on the Friday night beers, right? This this is like that's what you were doing. Like the introverted IT kind of guys. Like what what did you what kind of activities? Yeah, did you I launch? can't remember. Subtle I don't know. Like like chess comp- was well. it like a chess competition or what? No, no, no. I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. I cannot remember to be honest. I can't remember the ins and outs of it. Okay. Um, more all, the, all the big fellas on the board. He's, he's <laughs> no, well, was, well, this stuff was all. Hierarchy. This yeah. stuff. <laughs> this stuff was all a while ago, you know. So um, I can't remember the ins and outs of it. And 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 the reality is, like in that example that I'm using, the introverted people, the quieter people, they have made the business substantially better, right? They've made it more in depth. They've made it more detailed. They've they've improved the quality of of the business. Um, no end. So I can't remember the ins and outs of it and the details we do. But um, what I will say is, is um, we have spent so much money on staff development. We did an emotional intelligence degree. It was a six-month curriculum that we did. We, we've done so much stuff to improve culture. The drinks card on the Friday night – it's pretty much all you need. Everyone listening to that. That's our kind of business. It, right? <laughs> it, just, it just truly is, isn't it? Like oh, Friday, like now that I've come out of the footy you know, system and had no idea about these drinks on a Friday, like, fuck, people don't really even work on Friday. I swear they start drinking at like yeah, lunchtime. It's moving yeah, an hour it's forward every oh, year. Yeah, I <laughs> they get right. really toey on a yeah. Friday, don't they? Like everyone's just up and about, yeah. you know? Especially, yeah, the collaborative working spaces that we're Yeah, we're yeah, exactly. To. Yeah, the yeah, commons yeah. especially. Actually, people walking around with frothies and I'm like, I still need to upload this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, just before, because I, I really want to talk about reach. I think it's something yeah, that's, that's really reach. exciting. Yeah. But at what point, can you maybe just tell the listeners now where, I guess, from a scale point of view, Bastion is you know, in regards to office locations, employees, and then when you thought it was time for you to maybe get out? Uh, New York, LA, Auckland, Melbourne, Sydney uh, are our offices. We have 300 odd staff. Um, Roughly 200 in Australia, 50 in America, 50 in New Zealand. Um, I thought it was time to get out when I stopped adding value. So uh, my expertise and what I'm good at is is building stuff fast, new things, right? So not the organic growth of um, the evolution of a business, right? So like my deal with Jack or our deal together – was always like he'd grow the business by 20% a year doing the organic growth stuff and I'd grow by 100% by making a new acquisition or starting a new division or you're doing something we didn't do a year ago, right? Um, and that worked really well until it got to a size where it didn't work anymore. And, you know, we went to London and would I didn't really think that through properly and we lost a fortune in London. We had a business there for three years and we ended up losing – I think at the end of the day, six or seven hundred grand in in getting that going, and London's no longer there. We bought an esports team. We ran a whole bunch of events. We owned events. We lost a million bucks or something in the live events business. You know, um, like there was different examples like that where where I'm I'm thinking, well, I'll just do what I do, which is find new things, be entrepreneurial, sort of evolve it. But the business gets to a certain size, and you say, well. Those things are now totally different. Like live events is a completely different commercial model to what agency is, right? Um, or international is completely different to what localized is. And and so we're saying, well, once you put that into a, a pre-existing business with lots of staff and all that sort of stuff, it really doesn't integrate as well as, you know, what you do. Like you stick to your knitting thing, you know? And so I got to that conclusion where I was like, well, we wanted to get America to a point where it wasn't, touch and go and that was about two years ago and and that's when I, I said to Jack I said America's up and going um Australian business is good um we didn't have New Zealand at the time I said I, I reckon it's time to be more operational be have someone that's close to the clients like I wasn't that close to the clients you know all that sort of stuff and that's been um that was when I, I just thought I wasn't the right guy for this time you know and uh, and then stepped away Pretty uh, humbling to be able to do that. Yeah, I think that um, wouldn't have been easy. Three hundred people if you're starting it at twenty two as well. Yeah, and then running a company with three hundred <coughs> people. I mean, imagine two lunatics like us. <laughs> oh, 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 mate, <laughs> you're on. You, you're the chairman now, though. Yeah. So, I mean, the role of the chair. What is the role of the chairman in your eyes? Pick the CEO. Yeah. That's basically the job. Make sure the CEO is doing the right <laughs> doing the right thing. That's it. Being able to challenge and poke and prod and push um, where required and 
top line have oversight on what's going on. Most of the time, it's stay out of the way. Yeah. If you if you got a good CEO that's doing the job and doing the job right, and you're happy with the way he's doing the job, then get out of the way. You know, and and same thing. Like I went through a period where I'm trying to justify my value and you know doing more time and. This is not what it's about. Like, mm. it, 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 it's about making sure that at the end of the day, the buck stops, the operational buck stops with the CEO. The CEO is the one doing all the work. The CEO is the one that's responsible for the for the performance of the company. Um, and they're the, they're really the most important person in, in the business. But the buck stops with the chairman because the chairman picks the CEO. Right. So, so as the chairman, you hold ultimate responsibility for the success without actually – doing much, you know, and it's no different than the chairman of the AFL or any of that sort of stuff. The, and the board, they, they choose the, the CEO and the CEO does the rest. So that's sort of how it works. Who's on the board with you? No one. Oh, so it's just chairman. And oh, I'm cha- uh, sorry. me, my brother and my old man. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, we've had boards in the past and they've been brilliant. Like we've had high profile people. Um, we've had people from the industry, we've had all sorts of stuff, um, and they've been really great for our development, like an, as an advisory board, and, and has helped us evolve. And it's the same thing I was saying about me, like there's there's different people for different times, and and um, right now it's better run just between us yep. um, and oversight just us because it's a lot easier to just get things done, make decisions, all that sort of stuff, yep. and you know, it's our business. Because your business is so large, just on the board meetings, like how many times would you meet? We have a global board meeting once a quarter. So the head in New Zealand, so the CEO and CFO in New Zealand, CEO and um, and CFO of Australia and the CEO and the CFO of America all report to a board, sorry, on a monthly basis. We do that once a month globally. And then we have, uh, I meet with the, the heads of each division. So we'd have, I don't know, 20 or 25 meetings, maybe not that many, 20 meetings a quarter, once a quarter. So we have like two or three days where we just meet with every head of division for one hour just to make sure we're getting, you know, I can see what's going on in the business, get close enough to it, all that sort of stuff. But that happens every 90 days. Yeah. And then off that, if anything is alarming, what actions are taken? You just call the CEO and go, get fix this, mate. No, well, I say, you know, we, no, most of the time, Jack will come to me and say, listen, I, you know, like, I don't like the way this is working or that's working or we've got a bit of a problem here or that's, you know, whatever. Um, and we, we figure that out. Um, yeah, but sometimes I'll go, no, nah, that's not right. I'm not hearing the right thing or, you know, this doesn't work. And then we figure out what the best way is to, to deal with that. To be honest, most of the time, the guys that run our divisional heads, I mean, they're seasoned, experienced people. And the vast majority of the time, like sometimes these quarterly board managers go for 20 minutes, you know, like there's not. <clears throat> like, and we've, we've got it wrong in the past, like big governance thing. We have big board meetings, a full day stuff and once a month and big reports and all. I just think... It's a bit of a waste of time. You spend all your time writing reports for a board meeting rather than going selling and yeah. delivering work, yeah. you know? Um, and so we try and do as little as possible. And if it only requires a 20 minute meet because everything's going well, well, that's all it requires. Yeah, you know? nothing better than happy, a happy 20 days. No one wants yeah. a three hour meeting. <laughs> <laughs> our generation, anyway. Yeah, but before uh, we go to Reach, because yeah. I just want to ask our traditional questions oh, about Bastion, um, what's been the most challenging thing that you've faced so far throughout your journey on with Reach? With Bastion. Bastion? Sorry, with Bastion. Fuck um, out of there, sorry. Uh, uh, we nearly ran out of cash a few times. That was that was brutal. Um, so uh, we had the first time it ever happened was because as a service business, it's very hard to get debt, right? So it, it, it's very hard to borrow money from the bank as a marketing services company. It's just banks won't do it until you get to a certain size. So to build... You want to build and build, acquis- you know, through acquisition and other stuff like that. Um, or even you win a new client, you've got to put another five staff on. You've got to cash flow that five staff before the client pays you and all those sort of things. So that's where cash flow gets eaten up. Um, so we're continually dealing with that, making acquisitions, doing things. Then we had this perfect storm of in London, investing in London, building London and inevitably losing money. So we're getting in a worse cash position on a monthly basis. Then we're the live events business, investing in that, worst cash position on a monthly basis. We just made, I think, two acquisitions 
And then our sponsorship business lost a million dollars in the first quarter of this year. Not this year, whenever that was. It was six or seven years ago. Um, because it had a whole bunch of big deals get pushed back, waiting for global approval, like all this sort of stuff. And it just it was just this perfect storm. And we were just like, there were times where there's 50 bucks in the account and we got to pay 300 grand a payroll in two wow, weeks' time and yeah, stuff like God. that. Like, like the worst, right? Um, so th- that was just the pits, right? And and again, like if you run out of cash, you can. we're still profitable at this time, right? So the rest of the business is profitable and the things we we're investing in, we invested in too many things at the same time, which was bad business. And it would have been okay if everyone was hitting every target, but then we had this big, like we've never had that before, we've never had it again, this big loss in the sponsorship business. And then it's like, shit, this is a perfect storm of like real problem, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so unbelievably scary and scary because if you don't have enough cash to pay the payroll, like that's it, doesn't matter what you're doing you could be you could be the most profitable business in the world but you've invested all that profit into something else and you run out of dough you can't pay your wages like that's it you're gone down, yeah. um so that happened that time and it took us probably a couple of years to get out of it and there's it not as bad as that but it happened a couple of a couple other times where we flew pretty close to the sun or making acquisitions and doing other things but again um you, I, you know i heard the same story Rupert Murdoch tell pretty much identically the same story um, where he was two days out of not being able to make payroll for, you know, News Limited globally, you know. Now, it wasn't 300 grand payroll. It would have been <laughs> plenty, <million>. right? <laughs> um, but you hear those stories all the time, you know, and and that it's just what has to happen. You just got to suck it up and you got to get through it and you got to take the risk to do that. And now we get through and like, you know, it's a totally different story now, but, you know, it's hard. So now it makes sense, his response to my thing about it's not bold starting your business, it's bold through those, that, that, those <laughs> periods. Bold, that's it's bold acquiring. <laughs> when companies. you're living week to week at one <laughs> well, point. Well, that's you know. right. And like, you know, <clears throat> Ross, yeah. you know, and you're saying like, um, yeah, like there was plenty of times where I didn't get paid for six months or something, you know, like, and and all, it, it, all that stuff just is what it is, right? You can't really... Um, it's just what you got to do, you know, and and you go through it. It's difficult. It's hard. It's stressful. Like I talk about it now, I still get anxiety thinking about it. In some ways, it's made me a significantly better businessman because I won't. I try not to get myself in that position. But in some ways, it's made me worse because I don't want to get in that position again. You know, like I was talking to our CFO at Reach the other day, and um, I'm saying like. There is. This is our baseline number of cash. And she's like, no, it doesn't have to be that high. Like, you know, it can be. I was like, no. Nah. This is it because I'm not going through that again, <laughs> yeah. you know. And uh, and so in in many ways it's made me worse because I'm too scared about taking the risks that's required or I know too much about that sort of stuff. So it's finding the balance between the two that's important. And, again, I'm continually self-reflecting on that in everything we do because there will be, the, the, you know, there will be an opportunity in Bastion – to buy a big creative agency in New York and it'll cost us a fortune and it'll be a risk that if we take and go well, will propel us into one of the biggest independents in the world. Um, if we don't do it, or if we do it wrong, I could put us back, you know, a fair way. And, you know, when that day comes, am I going to have the ghoulies to go and do it? <laughs> I don't know the answer. Tom to that. Tell. <laughs> Tom Tom. Yeah. We'll keep watch on that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> the plums out in New York. <laughs> that is, uh, the, it's interesting. All right, thanks for sharing that because it's fantastic for everyone to, to listen to them stories. Everyone thinks it's all, uh, you know, just everything goes well and you grow, 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 but there's a lot of ups and downs in business. On the flip side, though, this is probably more positive, which we love. What's been the greatest moment so far in your journey at Bastion? Um, there's probably a few, but what's one that stands out front of mind? Oh, there is a bunch of stuff along the along the journey where you say, um, you know, we always thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to have an activation in Fed Square, you know, or at the Australian Open? And then three years ago or something, like we had six of them, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Like, right. um, so there's certain things like that where you, when you start, you go, oh, geez, well, wouldn't it be great if we did that or did this? or, And then they happen and then- you know, occasionally you get that moment of reflection where you go, oh, 
Yeah. Like, this is the thing we were talking about 10 years ago, you know, like we're doing it. Um, most of the time, I, me, I, I'm notoriously bad at glossing over that stuff. So I just, like, it's like, yeah, well, we said we were going to do it. We're doing it. Yeah, move on. Big fucking deal, you know, move it's on. athlete mindset. Um, growth and, mindset. Yeah, so, like, I'm notoriously bad at that stuff. So never really stop to sort of s- smell the roses or whatever or self-congratulate. Um, what I love is every month when the forecast says we're going to do X – and the actuals come in and they're X. Yeah. I go, that's great. <laughs> like, and, that, and that's been happening for, I don't know, two years. That's Pro- a, that's probably a, ever since Jack took over. Pe- <laughs> 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 That'd probably be your biggest like pet hate or not pet hate, but like that, that obviously forecast to act- to actuals. Mate, do what you say you're going to do. That's yeah. the big thing, right? Yeah. It's, it's a big thing. That's the thing. It's just do what you say you're going to do. So although every time we set budgets, it's the same same way we run reach. It's like they're not my budget, it's your budget, right? So you do what it is. If I think you can push the limits a bit, then I'll tell you. If I think you're, you're pushing too hard, I'll tell you. But I'm not going to – at the end of the day, it's your call, right? Um, and so – and. You know, we didn't do this perfectly for a long time, but we certainly do now. So, you know, you work for me, you put a budget down, that's the number. Go, okay. But that's the number. That's what you do. You know, like <clears throat> you do what you say you're going to do. That's it. I'll stay out of your way. I'm not going to bug you. I'm not going to grill you, but yeah. you deliver. There's deliver. always a few nervous people on the last oh, day. That red, the that. Or yeah, yeah, the mate, CEO's going to buzz me soon if this one doesn't Can come you imagine through. one day out and you need a couple of bucks? <laughs> come on, mate. <laughs> Mate, he's on me blower. I've got a meeting at Norm with Ferg tomorrow, mate. He's <laughs> doing the deal with <laughs> I'll come round and sign it with you. <laughs> but they, um, you know, that's that. So that's been that's been great. Like yeah. for the last, I don't know, at least couple of years, it's pretty much month on month, and it's always now to a point where it's like identical to the dollar and I go really yeah. it was really yeah. to the dollar no, you know no, you haven't pushed it. a bit in the next month you know sandbagging <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, yeah. he loves his stretch targets yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. Oh, that's brilliant well um, thanks for sharing all that about Bastion we're um, yeah we're stoked to talk about it but now you, like you just said you're now the CEO of Reach um, Foundation and it's something that's really close to home for you and um, you've been, you know, you've been there from a, a young man, and you've done all the facilitation yourself. So, just talk a little bit more about what Reach is. You've already touched on it and what you're doing, and um, yeah, and how we can all support. So, preventative youth mental health. So, you look at the, um, you look at the mental health crisis that's going on at the moment, right? You can't pick the paper up without reading some story about either a young person who's struggling or the crisis going on. There's a stat that gets rolled around that one in four young people have, you know, had suicidal thoughts in the last. Um, couple of years, the last 12 months, um, y- you know, all that stuff is very real, right? And it's very real and it's, and it's very now and it's, it's showcasing because we've gone through COVID and it's been two years of shit. Um, and it's put stress and pressure on all of our mental health. The reason we're struggling now is not because of COVID. COVID has showcased it. COVID is, is what's sort of pushed us into this thing, but COVID is just a large scale issue that we've had to deal with and which shows we're not dealing with it very well, right? Young people are adults. We're not dealing with it very well. The reason we're not dealing with it very well is because five years ago or 10 years ago when we had to develop the mental muscles to be able to deal with these things, we didn't do the work, right? The equivalent of me saying to you, let's go run a marathon and you've never gone for a run before, you're not getting through the marathon, right? Or if you do and you grit yourself and get through, you're bloody sore and you feel shitty at the end of it. It's no different to mental health development, right? But what we do with young people as a society is we academically develop them pretty well. Um, we physically develop them, so through team sport and sport at school and all those sort of things, you know, physical development. But we don't do preventative mental development as well as we should. Better, we're better and better at it, but we don't get anywhere near it. That's what Reach does. Reach goes into schools. Seventy um, percent of what we do is preventative work, so we go into schools doing this work with young people, actively, very intense, emotively developing the, the, their their mental state and developing their social and emotional resilience skills because of that. Um, 
And 30% of what we do is, is intervention community work. So high risk young people, people that come from bad background, people that are, are high risk for whatever, whatever reason. And we go in and work with them as well. So that's what REACH does. Um, and you know, we're going to impact about 50,000 young people over the next 12 months. Um, our aim is to build that into 500,000 young people over whatever period, probably the next five years, maybe longer. Um, if we can directly impact 500,000 young people over a 12 month period, then we are genuinely shaping or supporting to shape the next generation of, of Australians. That's what we're all about. It's powerful. It's great. It's um. Did you ever have Reach come to your school growing up? I, I forget. I, I feel like they did, but I, I can't recall. I just know the name. I've always oh, known the know name. Know if they did? Yeah. Well, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible what they to break down what Reach, which Reach does. Do you want to touch on um what actually happens in these workshops? So we go into so let's take a school workshop as an example. So we'll go into um, a school year nines primarily. So our our major cohort year fives and sixes and year nines and tens and then we also work with young adults so 18 to 25 so young corporates and graduates and stuff like that right so let's take school workshops year nine so we go in there with it we go in there with a year nine and and we we do the work from a, a in a group there's about 60 young people in the room our facilitators are young people themselves so our facilitators are pretty much all under the age of 25 and um, and that's because it's important that you get peer-to-peer -peer dynamics. So you get you connect with the people that you're doing the work with because a lot of the work is being able to open up, being able to emotionally be vulnerable. And if you're not emotively connecting, a bit like I spoke about before, if you're not emotively connecting the person's doing the work, then the, the, you, you're not going to open up. You're not going to feel comfortable. You're not going to feel safe. So we go in. We work with the young. We work with the young people. Um, Doing, doing activities and workshops that allows them to sort of open up about themselves, create a safe space. We emotively, you know, raise the energy of the room, drop the energy of the room and start to get them, start for them to open up about what's really going on for them in their lives. How are they feeling? What's really happening? And then we facilitate those conversations. So they, they have real conversations talking about real things. They do that personally and in a group setting. Um, and then, you know, they experience that as a group. Um, often we'll get bullies apologising to the kids they bully. We'll get, um, you know, we'll get young people um, being able to develop these skills in themselves so they make slightly better decisions day by day moving on in their life. And, uh, and that's what gives them the strength to sort of to, to live a full, powerful life. That's incredible. I'm because I'm obviously a bit far from the school system now. Is that something that we're going to be seeing in curriculums, like more sort of – or is that uh, still is that uh, still a gap from when we were back in school? It's a gap. Yeah, I'd love it to be, but at the moment we have to directly reach out to schools and schools hire us. Now, when Jim Steins and Paul Curry founded this thing twenty eight years ago, they are pioneers. They pioneered this work. Work didn't exist. They invented it, and um, and they've created, you know, and and that's been a, a three decade legacy that that they've done. So, yeah, you can imagine thirty years ago trying to get this work into schools. Like, yeah, you know, it was like an uphill battle. Now, schools recognise that there is a direct correlation between strong mental health and academic performance. Schools recognise the importance of this work. There's a whole bunch of other um, competitors, if you will. And, I mean, we're all, we're all aiming for the same goals, so they're not necessarily competitors, but yep. they do the same stuff and they compete with the same schools. Um, and so, so the work is there, but it's not in the curriculum. Right. So my discussions with government have been – you know, government given given a charity like us half a million bucks, it's nice for a year, but it doesn't create a sustainable model because what that means is you give us half a million bucks, we go deliver a bunch of workshops, what are we doing next year? We're knocking on the door again saying I need another half a million, right? And that cycle continues because unless you can create a good sustainable commercial model as a business, you continually going to be relying on handouts. And that's my knock on the charity world is the charity world is relying on handouts that doesn't have a sustainable business model. So my discussion with the government is stop giving us money, give the money to the schools and tell them to spend it with us mm. right? or, or organisations like us. Because if that happens and it is genuinely part of the curriculum, it gets resourced appropriately, um, it gets time in the calendars, it all that sort of stuff um, uh, that goes from there. And that, that's the way it really should work. 
Um, governments should be funding preventative solutions, high net wealth, you giving you 50 bucks to charity. We should be we should be investing in preventative solutions. But what we do as a society, whether it's government, whether it's us, you know, donating 50 bucks, whether it's a high net wealth donating 100 grand, there's a young person that is perceived to have no obvious issues on the surface, right? And you go, you meet him, nice kid, you know, are you going to invest in him? The kid that's just struggling a bit, you know, a bit depressed, feels a bit shitty, just having a bit of a tough time, invest in him. Or the kid that's self-harming and having suicidal thoughts and in a very high-risk scenario, you invest in him. And the reality is the kid with no perceived issues no one cares about, the kid that just feels a bit shitty no one really cares about, as soon as you start self-harming, the floodgates of funding open and we're happy to throw millions and millions, if not billions of dollars at intervention work at that point, right? Now, that point is really necessary because that young person is really in need right now. But if you don't invest in the first two kids, you'll continue to get the third kid. And and that's that's where society's got to change, you know? And that's really my mission. That's the thing that that I'm most um, passionate about is, is and don't get me wrong, we need to continue to have funding for, for the high-risk intervention work. But five years ago, 2017, there was $150 billion invested in, into health in this country, and 1.3% of that was in preventative solutions. So, you, you know, you say, oh, okay, well, then COVID hits five years later. And we wonder why we're struggling to get, because we're, we're waiting for you to get sick before we give you any money. We won't preventatively, you know, we won't allow you to do a pre-season to then when, when it comes time that you nearly need the skills, we'll go and do it. So that's what we're all about at Reach. We're all about getting in front of as many young people as we possibly can. We're all about being able to um, work with them to develop as many, as many social and emotional resilience skills as they can so they can go out and live their life. And my job is to out there, go out there and, and spread the word so people really focus on the preventative solutions um, so we can genuinely create systemic change long term and create strong heads. Fighting a good fight. It's, um, it's incredible. Just to talk about the generation sort of now, the, the youth um, that you would be working with, because I think everyone would say in their time when they were at youth, you know, there was difficulties and things that made it not so easy for them, maybe when their brain was developing or stigmas. But it's quite challenging for today because of technology for some of these kids that are probably developing brains, like they go online and the next thing you know, they can see something violent, they can be on the front line of war or whatever it is, you know, COVID, all these propaganda kind of things. Is that is that an issue? For, yeah, for these absolutely. kids now. Okay, so so the way it works is um, the young mind, right, as you're developing, as you're developing your brain, um, you are continually drawing on on um, uh, uh, things that happen in your life that form your view on the world, right, and form your mental development. So you turn up to school, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too thin, you're too fat, you form a view of that. You don't just turn up and you're the tallest kid or the shortest kid or the fattest kid in class and just get on with your life. You look around and you say, I'm different, whatever that might be, right? Or your stock standard is the same as everyone else. You're forming a view on that, right? You you answer a question wrong in class, right? And someone giggles in the corner. That just doesn't gloss over you. That goes into your psyche and, and creates a layer around your spirit and who you are and starts to form these sort of outer layers in, in our life, right? That is what goes into developing the developing brain. And so that's what happens. So you, you want to be able to, you know, have these things. Now, the modern world, it's how the war, you know, the, the Russian war in Ukraine. When we're kids, right, what happens? You pick the paper up maybe if you're a 15-year-old no. and like <laughs> – you know, do you read like, but let's like, say, you, let's say your old man's watching the news at night and you might see a story on the Channel 7 News or something. That's it, right? Maybe someone's talking about school. Now, you pick your phone up and you're not just like getting a little BBC and news fight, clip. Like TikTok pilot. live, yeah. like literally watching Fucking. people blow each other up. Yeah, yeah, right? And so you're then, you're a 15, 16 year old or a 13 year old or whatever, and you're looking at that stuff. That is going into your psyche and developing in the developing brain, right? Plus, 
you add to that that it's always on. So you're not really switching off. You're always on your phone. You're always looking at this stuff. You're, you're getting this overload of content. So all these things are going in creating this personality and we're not then giving you an ability to deal with that by creating the you know, and developing the mo- mental muscles to be able to deal with it. So I heard a thing the other day with some old bloke saying, you know, young people just got to toughen up. <laughs> it's like sure. it's just – it's – it's ridiculous because it's not old school toughen up. It's not you feel shit, fucking get over it, deal with it. You know, it's not that. And that's what they talk about when they talk about young people just toughening up, right? Young people toughening up comes about because when they're 13 or 14 or 15, they're being developed in a way that they can deal with these things, right? Not get to a point which happens in the AFL all the time now. There's always someone missing for a mental health reason or there's some other problem going on or it happens in business all the time, mental health days, all that's just – what's happening now is it's okay now to go, you know, I'm struggling. It's okay to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad way. But we're not solving it before it gets there, you know. So it's like I'm in a bad way, toughen up. Well, what? Yeah. You know, like, hang what's on. What's the intellectual approach to this? Yeah, and, to this? and what's the actual reality? Like, we know the science. You know, this is not new stuff. Like, we know the science, um, and we need to be able to develop it and, pu- and put some effort and energy into it. And, we, you know, it's getting there. The world's sort of moving, but it's moving very slowly. Mm. And you're missing millions of kids. Yeah, and what you're doing is so powerful. What, what, when you when you say you go to the government, because I, I, you're spot on with your approach. Like you, you've gone, Fuck, we need to go to them and just get this in the curriculum. And once it is in the calendars, that's when it's going to be you know huge across Australia and hopefully the world. But when you go to the government, just briefly, like who do you go to and what do you like? What do you got to say to these guys? Like, and how many people are just doing the same thing? It must be tough. Um, well, there's different ministers that look after these portfolios and. Um, there's different non-governing bodies that are the voice of youth and some of those sort of things that feed back into the government. But, um, yeah, it is, you know, like, like, uh, governments, I mean, we've just gone through this election, right? So you go through the election, the federal election, we got the state election in Victoria coming up in November. Um, in my view, the terms aren't long enough for them to do anything. So they, they come in with a short, a short term, So they can't really do anything. They're looking for stuff that move the needle over a three or four year period and things that doesn't happen, you know? So we generally underinvest in long-term solutions and overinvest in short-term solutions because we've got to move the needle every election cycle. This isn't new stuff. We know this is an issue of politics generally. Um, And it's not just in mental health. It's in, it's in everything. But yeah, the job is to, my, my, my view on government is, um, They'll change when the people change, right? So if society genuinely changes their view and their actions and your average punter on the street is actively changing the way they they see the world from this perspective, um, then the governments will change accordingly. But and, and, and until society does, I think the governments will continue to do what they they do most likely occasionally there'll be a progressive sort of person who really wants to push something but um most of the time i think it's societal led speak of the marketing background how how important is marketing actually this as opposed to actually helping kids because to to obviously change the thought and process of i assume you'd have good data and insights of like genuine things that could actually make people more more aware of maybe. it's huge so the so the 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 brand connection so being able to connect through content is a really important thing um and being able to sort of develop and connect the brand that's a really important component right partly because you do that and you spread the word and more people are talking about it and there's more positive action and all that sort of stuff but also young people that are out there who don't go into one of our workshops they need to know that it's out there and that they're not alone by connecting through our brand, right? So there's 8 million young people at school in this country. There's roughly 2 million that sit within our broad demographic that we impact. We impact 50,000 a year. So we don't touch the sides, you know, Um, and we're the biggest. So we don't touch the sides. 
that's why we've got to get to, to half a million young people a year because at that point we're actually starting to, you know, that's a quarter of our available demographic and that we're starting to move the needle there. Of the, every positive impact one of those half million young people have, they impact one or two others. You start to you start to get some good ripple effect, we call it, right? Um, but at 50,000, you know, we, we, we literally have to grow 10 times to be able to sort of move the needle on this. And we are the most, we are the pioneer in this, right? We are the biggest brand. We're the biggest organization. We're doing the most work, all that sort of stuff. It really at the cold face of developing the mental brain. Um, and, you know, and, and so we've got to grow, we've got to build. And, and so that, that's what we're doing. So those who don't, can't get into our work for whatever reason, they need to interact with their brand. So they need to engage with the content. They need to see the stories of our facilitators, see the stories of the young people. They need to emotively engage. And if they can do that at the very least, they're then sitting there thinking, I'm not alone. I'm learning. I'm engaging. And that's a lot of the stuff we're, we're going to be launching um, is access to e-content and ability to sort of engage with this stuff online. Amazing. Well, well put. Yeah, well, it's a great, I mean, it works really well. Bastion, <coughs> Reach, yeah. your impact. I can see the passion. Um, I haven't announced this publicly. I might as well do it on the podcast, but I'm going to jump on board and become an ambassador, which I'm really um, excited for, and the Heroes Day coming up, which is, which I think is going to really um, hit me for six. I can't wait to, uh, like you said, it's really shaped you as a person. So I'm actually really excited for that. I'll have to get you on board, mate. We'll talk off air, but we're looking <laughs> to get a lot of people on board because um, it, it is really powerful what, what Reach are doing. They, as I said, they, I remember being 15 when they come to our school and everyone breaking down and crying and connecting and having these deep conversations. And, you know, these days people probably don't have them unless they're on the beers, to be honest. You need to have more of these sober to, and break down a few layers. So congratulations on everything you, you're doing so far because it's only been a short term. Um, and also congratulations on your third bub not long ago, Thanks, mate. mate. You must be really struggling with mate, sleep at the moment. You <laughs> <laughs> told me the three ages before. I said, geez, chaos. You just looked at me. Yeah, and mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I might run out of gas sitting here. Yeah, yeah, I am, I that's uh, why we're going to have to. I don't want to hold you up. We've got to. Um, Reignite you. <laughs> we have a couple of segments, Jakey. You can, uh, with the, the Caps moment, we've kind of touched on the moment in just bashing, but the Caps moment is the greatest moment in your professional career uh, that stands out and, and why. Um, so if you were to think about everything that you've done um, in your professional career, what, what was that one moment you think? Um, the Caps moment. You can put it on if you want, mate. I don't want to mess the hair up, but we love our, we love our boys at Caps. Hopefully I mean, it's big the enough. 10 goals that uh, Woodfield West Torrens wouldn't go astray. Well, <laughs> ten, 10 sausages in the, in the seconds is not uh, easy. It opened up a can of worms. Um, uh, the... Uh, Oh, the Caps moment. Mate, I don't know. Like I said, I'm sort of appalling at at, at this sort of stuff. Um but occasionally you know, occasionally there are there are some some big moments that happen, but I, I'm struggling to think of one right now. Outside of what I said before about starting to see some of this stuff come up. Um you know, there was a time where we were calling ourselves the largest independent in the country. And we probably weren't. And then um, I just made it up. And then now we are, and we are by a long shot. Um, so that you know, that's that's quite nice to know that you've done something that not many before you have done. Um, that starts to be a reasonably nice thing. But I hope my caps moment is there to me, you know. And I hope it's with Reach, and I hope we can do something with Reach that genuinely impacts the community, you know. And that's. You know, that's what uh, what I, I really want to look back on a very broad life. I've got a view um, with the way I father my three kids and uh, and what's important to me is that I create the opportunity for opportunities, right? That's sort of the way. So if my kid wants to be a ballet dancer, they want to be a footballer, they want to be a stockbroker, or they want to be an artist or whatever, they should have the same opportunity within our family as any of the other kids that want to do whatever else, right? Um, and so it's on me to make sure that I, I can spread that as much as I can and I can get as much knowledge myself as I can to ensure that when he turns around or one of them turn around and say, I want to be a farmer, we go, great, here's the opportunity for opportunity. You've got to sort it out yourself, you've got to create your own opportunities, but here's the first leg up, right? Or footy or marketing or whatever. Um, you know, and, and that's... That's one of the reasons why the reach work connects 
really well with me. Um, it's because it allows me to do that. So yeah. there you go, the Caps moment. That's probably the first future moment for Cap. Yeah, Catlin. I like that answer. We'll get him back in a few years Definitely. when he's hit a million, not five hundred <laughs> kids. So thanks for sharing that, mate. And uh, one more segment, Jackie. Yes. Yeah, so the famous brand at Rick Sawyer, as you know well, Ferg. No, oh, well. Um, when when you've achieved all your goals with Reach and and you've you've done all you want, you're retiring. Where, what destination are you throwing the feet up in? Outside of this city, of course. Um, we have a farm in Uroa that my wife runs, a sheep farm, and uh, and I love it up there. It's um, it's an amazing place, Uroa. It's uh, and the farm is awesome. So we're sort of developing that. So I'd love. Where's Uroa? I'm a frustrated farmer, Northern Victoria. Oh, this that's up there with Mount Eliza. Yes, this is. A, this we've is been a... taking like grand. We've get we've got grand ones of like I don't know Turkey, Dubai, this younger. that, and then now yeah, we've got a couple local. Well, this is the famous, once you've made it, just once go to the country it. and check out and Love hang that. out with the family. Mate, yeah, the country's the answer. Well, my wife and I do talk about going and living in Nice for a year in the south of France. Oh, yeah, that's a crappy <laughs> <spot. laughs> yeah. Okay, now we've met yeah. both expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Getting get in the south of France for a bit. We'd love to do that with the kids one day when the kids are um, maybe primary school age or whatever. We've probably got another, I don't know if we keep having kids, another 10 or 15 <laughs> years ahead of us. But, um, you know, we'd love to do that sort of thing. Um my wife loves Hawaii, so um, we could do that. Hawaii, but, that sounds all right. Oh, that's mm. just made, isn't it? Made in heaven. Well, mate, on behalf of uh, everyone here at the Aces, everyone listening, no doubt, thoroughly would have enjoyed that. Thank you so much for your time. Um, wish you all the you know the success in the world at Reach and obviously Bashan and everything else. Um, and uh, at home as well with the three kids. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, I no doubt everyone will get a lot out of it. We'll get you back on again um, to get us an update. And, uh, yeah, if you need anything from us to promote Reach, we're here. Like I said, I'm, I'm very excited to jump on board as an ambassador. It actually is worth sharing. When I said to you, what do you expect as an ambassador, not just for Reach but for anything, it's pretty powerful what you said. What did I say? Spread the word. Yeah, you said spread the word and um, make it, you know, kind of make a difference. And it was kind of like very basic, you know, people can overcomplicate it. Um, and yeah, influence was one thing you yeah. said. So if we can influence um, schools to j call you guys and um, get parents to be more aware of their kids and what they need to kind of develop and prevent um, instead of trying to worry about checking into these services after the fact, then uh, that, that'd be great. So yeah, really pumped to be on board. And um, yeah, like I said, Wishing you guys nothing but success. Really keen to see where you take it. Mate, awesome. It's been good to be here. You guys have got a great podcast, so it's good fun. Thanks for listening to another episode. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please feel free to hit us up on our social channels, at Osmerican Aces. If you're entertained, inspired, or feel more educated, please share it with your friends and family because we appreciate the support. Righto, catch you on the next one.